Hello, welcome to Bits and Bytes. In this episode, we're going to look at various types of computer languages. First, the languages that we speak when we program the computer, programming languages, and then the language that the computer itself speaks, machine language. After that, we'll see how programming languages are translated into machine language by a means of interpreter or a compiler. We're also going to examine logo, a computer language especially designed for children. But we'll start with examples of three of the most common programming languages, and Billy Van will examine each of them in turn. Oh. Here's one that looks a lot like the program I wrote the other day. Ah, I see the words print, go to, if, then, input. Yes, that's the same programming language you used in an earlier episode. It's called BASIC, Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. That's quite a mouthful. But it means exactly what it says. It's a general purpose language for beginners. Shall I run it? Sure. Okay. Oh, that's pretty. It's a nice pattern being formed here. Now I'll take a look at the language on this computer. Oh, my goodness, that's very short. There's a lot of symbols here I don't understand, though. This programming language is quite tricky to learn, but it's very concise and compact. Just a few instructions can get the computer to do a great many things. It's really a set of very elegant mathematical notations. Well, what's it called? APL. That just stands for a programming language. And what does it do? This one is for teachers. It'll put the students' marks in ranking order. Type in a few numbers to represent marks and you'll see. Okay. Let's see, what would students get in examinations? So we'll say uh, 95. Mm -hmm. uh, 98. 76. How did you do in French? 12, <laughs> 5, 5. Oh, boy, that is really fast. And all that in just a short program. It certainly doesn't waste any words. Contrast it with the language on the next computer. Oh, this one goes on and on. In fact, what you're looking at is just part of a program. The complete listing is on the printout. Oh, look at all of this. But you know, it looks a lot more like English than APL does. Add discount to invoice discount total, and net to invoice net total. Mm -hmm. You're right, it is. What you lose on length, you gain on ease of reading. So this is another language for beginners? Oh, no, not at all. It's mainly for business. That's why it's called COBOL, Common Business Oriented Language. Actually, it's the most widely used business language for computers in the world. You see the effects of COBOL every day. Every time you get a computerized bill, receipt, or a statement, it's nearly always been prepared by a program written in COBOL. Oh, really? I never knew that. Shall I run this program? You can if you like, but I have to warn you, all it does is print out a lot of bills. Oh, well, we all get enough of those. I think I'll pass on it. So let me see now. BASIC is for beginners and general use. APL is for mathematical calculations, and COBOL is for business. Are there many other programming languages? There are hundreds of them. But these are three of the most common ones that people can speak when they talk to the computer. But the machine itself, at its innermost level, speaks another language altogether. Aha, bits and bytes again. We talked about that earlier in the series. We talked about some of it. But the bits and bytes, the ones and zeros, are like an alphabet that the computer uses. It also has a special way of organizing the switching on and off of its circuits. It has a grammar and a syntax all of its own, which is called machine language. Well, how does machine language work exactly? I'll give you a very simple example. In any of the programming languages, or as are also called high-level languages, you can give the command print 2 plus 3. When this is translated into machine language, you get this in binary code, which is rather a lot to translate print 2 plus 3. But what it's actually saying in machine terms is this. Load the accumulator with number 2, clear the carry, Add with carry the number three, then jump to the print subroutine. 
What a rigmarole, just to add a couple of numbers. And this is the only language that the computer really uses. That's it. And it's very different from high-level language. So how can the computer understand BASIC and APL and so on? It can't, unless you give it a special program to translate from these high-level languages into machine language. Let's have a look at how this works. In the early days of computing, there was a language barrier between computers and humans because you had to use machine language if you wanted to talk to the computer, either in binary code or its exact English equivalent. This was very slow and laborious. Every time a generalist wanted to tell the computer to print something, or make a decision, or repeat an operation, he had to break every statement down into tiny electronic steps. The same for the mathematician who had to translate all his math symbols into long-winded computer talk. And even the businessman who just wanted to do payrolls and inventories and make out bills to his customers had to spell everything out in nitpicking machine language. But eventually, after a number of years, people began to realize that they were translating the same fundamental ideas into machine language over and over again. So they made lists of the instructions and symbols and procedures that each of them used most frequently, and they called these lists high-level languages. For example, BASIC for generalists, APL for mathematicians, and COBOL for businessmen. And then they prepared automatic dictionaries, which, just like English-French dictionaries, contained a list of all the vocabulary of the particular high-level language in one column with its machine language equivalent in a second column. Then, whenever someone wanted to use a key word or symbol or procedure in the high-level language, this dictionary would look it up, find out what it meant in machine language, and pass this on to the computer. These dictionaries, which automatically translated from a high-level program into a low-level machine language program were in fact themselves programs, translator programs. And as soon as translator programs came into existence, people no longer had to speak machine language if they didn't want to. They could speak much more convenient languages such as BASIC or APL or COBOL or FORTRAN or LISP or PASCAL or FORTH or any of hundreds of other specialized high-level languages that have developed over the years. The language barrier between computers and humans had broken down. But have we really broken through the language barrier? I mean, BASIC isn't exactly ordinary English. No, not exactly. And you'll probably never be able to talk to the computer in ordinary English because human languages are full of ambiguity. And that's one thing the computer can't cope with. But there's a programming language that's much more natural for us than BASIC. Go over to the Texas Instruments computer. You'll find that the translator program for this language is contained in that black cartridge. It's another form of ROMPAC. Logo, what does that stand for? Nothing, it's just a name. Put the logo ROMPAC into the computer. Okay. You see, the basic translator program is already built into the ROM memory of this computer. And you've just added logo, so now you have a choice between two high-level languages. Okay, so I'll press two. Mm-hmm. Now what? Type, tell turtle. Tell turtle? Let me explain that logo is a language developed mainly for children. You start off by drawing pictures with something called a turtle. Okay. Oh, that little triangle, is that the turtle? That's the turtle. Now tell it to draw something. For example, a square. All right, draw a square. What's going on? Don't forget that for the computer, you have to define everything step by step. But at least in this case, the computer talks to you in a very natural way. Okay. Uh, all right, turtle, now I have to get you to draw a line to start, so... How would I do that? 
You could discover all this by trial and error. But to save time, I'll tell you that to make the turtle move, you can either type forward or back. All right, forward. Oh, wait a minute. It didn't move at all. Uh, what more should I tell it? You didn't tell it how far to move. This time, tell it to go forward 30 units. Forward 30. Oh, it did it, right. Now, I'd like to get it to draw a line to the right. How would I do that? First, you make the turtle turn to the right, then you make it go forward. So I just type right. Uh, now, that's too vague. Computers can't tolerate vagueness, even in logo. How many degrees do you want the turtle to turn? Well, actually, I'm going to attempt to draw a square here, so it'll be 90 degrees. Type right 90. Oh, I see. And now, forward 30. Good. And just continue on. There we go. Is this a program? No. Those are direct commands. The computer won't remember that. To start programming in Logo, you tell the computer to draw square, or simply, to square. But you must start with the word to, T-O. OK. To square. You see, you're now in the programming or editing mode. Well, does that mean I have to type forward 30, right 90, forward 30, right 90 all over again? No, you can condense that into one line, and you won't need line numbers either. Oh, terrific. How do I shorten it? First, press Enter, then tell it to repeat forward 30, right 90, four times. Type repeat four. Now in brackets, forward 30, right 90. Okay. Is that all? Yes. You've now written a program in Logo that tells the computer how to draw a square. See if it works. Press the function key and 9 to leave the programming mode. OK. Type CS to clear the screen. Type tell turtle and the word square. Tell turtle square, OK. Well, that's all very nice, but where does it take us? Ah, but this is only the beginning. One of the many good things about Logo is that once you've taught the computer how to do something, it remembers it. And you can build on that to do more and more complicated things. I'll give you just one very simple example. Type CS again to clear the screen. Now type this. Repeat 8 and then, in brackets, write 45 square. Okay. Look at that. Well, that's terrific. So logo is a good way to get geometrical patterns. It's a lot more than that. It's also an excellent way to teach geometry to young children, not to mention physics, logical thinking, problem solving. In fact, some people claim that it's a way to get children to think about thinking itself. The language of a human being is essentially the texture of his life. One of the components of the logo environment is the logo computer language. And this computer language is the only one right now that has been specifically designed in order to take into consideration the way people think and the way children learn. Oh, should be easy. No, that should be hard. 
Logo is first and foremost not a computer language. Most people are addressing their comments on Logo at the level of the technical features of the language. The people who develop Logo don't see it primarily as a language. They see it as an educational philosophy. Now he's going to go up there. Some of the important ideas that we have tried to implement in Logo came from one of our masters, Professor Jean Piaget. I think everybody recognizes today that Piaget made some very keen observations on the way children grow and how their intelligence develops. What is important in Logo is that the child is in control of the development of his own intellectual activity. The kids decided they wanted to name the turtle, so they named him Apple Dumpling, and then the first thing we did was make our stuffed apple dumplings that are all over the ceiling. Because the children have a lot of say in the kinds of things that we do, I gave them the option of using their creative language writing period to write about apple dumpling. We have to learn how to write creatively and so on, but if we can make it more fun, so much the better. Craig, could you read your chapter one about how apple dumpling came to be? Long, long ago, in a galaxy far from us, there was a family that got shot into space. The family was a turtle family. The mother was pregnant. There was an explosion and it affected the baby. She finally had the baby. Everybody screamed because the baby was triangle shaped. Logo learning is characterized by things like a strong belief that we put too much emphasis in traditional learning on being right and wrong, a high degree of self-initiative on the part of the learner, a belief that learning should be enjoyable and a mutually supportive social context. So the role of the teacher will change very dramatically in that case. And this, I think, promises a rather more enjoyable, healthy, personal role for, uh, for the teacher. I put L-Y. Oh, I know how to kill it. The teacher is an essential element of a logo experiment or a logo class. Not in the sense that he is a teacher, but he is a keen observer of the activities of his children. The kids ask them some very good questions. And the teacher feels that he is really doing his job as a teacher and not as a policeman. I find, especially in my situation where we've got 14 computers normally, there are 14 different questions almost being asked at the same time. I think teachers who are going to get computers in their classroom are going to find that things do seem to occur much more quickly because kids are far more motivated. They're real keen. You're not really teaching them things. You're letting them go ahead and find out things on their own. Every child that, that sat down with Logo did different things. You, you gave them four basic commands, but everybody who started had a different reaction to it. The teachers will adapt very, very easily. One thing for sure is they will not be able to prevent the appearance of computers. And if they try, they're going to lose. The teachers, along with the children, will discover the great power of these new technologies and they will be participating themselves in the discoveries with the kids. Good, just as I wanted it. What we have tried to do is a first step in the direction of humanizing the computer, where the focus of attention is not the computer itself, but the mind of the child. Boy, I wish I had Logo when I was a kid at school. Can you get this on most microcomputers? Yes. You'll soon be able to get some version of Logo on any computer, but we only have it here on the Texas Instruments, the Apple, and the Radio Shack Color Computer. And on the Texas Instruments, the Logo Translator is on a ROM pack. That's it. How about the Apple? You can bring Logo into the RAM memory of the Apple by means of a floppy disk. That's an Apple Logo package on top of the computer. Oh. So there are two ways of adding a Logo Translator program to your computer, by means of a disk, or a ROM pack. Do you have to add a basic translator program to your computer as well? Most micros have basic built in, but there are one or two that don't. For example, do you remember in one of our earlier episodes, you looked at an Atari ROM pack? Yes, I remember, it's over there. Have a look at that ROM pack again. 
Ah, basic. I see. But all the other computers that we've seen so far all come with their own special basic translator program as part of their circuitry. Do you mean there are different sorts of basic? Let's say that there are many different dialects of basic. For example, Apple basic is not the same as pet basic or Atari basic. That's one of the reasons why many ready-made computer programs aren't interchangeable between different computers. And on top of that, there's all the other languages. APL, COBOL, FORTRAN, PASCAL. It's like the United Nations. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid it is. Well, can you get these other languages on most micros? Some of the languages you can. Well, I could make my computer multilingual by plugging in a translator program. An interpreter, really. In the case of BASIC, LOGO, and APL, that's what the translator program usually is, an interpreter. But in the case of COBOL and FORTRAN, the translator program is a compiler. There are important differences between interpreters and compilers that you need to know about if you want to understand how computers work. When you land in the world of computers with their strange, convoluted machine language, it's a bit like landing on another planet whose inhabitants speak an equally strange, convoluted alien language. Getting a mechanic on planet Gobbledygook to repair your spaceship would present the same sort of problem that you have when you want to get a computer to do something. Everything you say has to be translated. And you have a choice between two different sorts of translator. One of them is called an interpreter, and the other is called a compiler. Let's suppose that you've previously written out your list of instructions for the repair of your spaceship. And suppose that you choose the interpreter to do the translating. He reads your first instruction, open lid of rocket engine, translates this into gobbledygook, and immediately passes it on to the mechanic who executes the instruction. Then the interpreter reads your second instruction, remove spark plug, translates this into gobbledygook and passes it on to the mechanic who executes it. And so on and so forth. Now, notice how the interpreter works. He stays with you all the time and he translates each of your instructions immediately, one by one. This is a rather slow process because the mechanic has to wait while each instruction is being translated. But, on the other hand, it does give you a chance to correct your mistakes as you go along. If the mechanic removes the wrong spark plug, for instance, you'll see this happen right away, and you'll be able to change your instruction accordingly. Compare this with the way the second sort of translator, the compiler, goes about his work. He takes your complete list of instructions, and without further ado, translates the whole lot straight into gobbledygook. He then hands them back to you and goes away, leaving you all on your own. All this has taken some time, but from now on, things will go very fast. You hand the complete list of gobbledygook to the mechanic, and he executes them all in one go. Bang, bang, bang. There's no waiting about this time. But there's one disadvantage to this, of course. If there was a mistake in your instructions, it's too late now. This analogy comes very close to the way the interpreter and compiler translator programs actually work with computers. An interpreter runs slowly, starts right away, and lets you see how things are going. Whereas a compiler takes extra preparation time before your program can run, but then lets it run very quickly and efficiently. To help you remember the difference between an interpreter and a compiler, look at the words themselves. Inter means between. The interpreter is always between your program and the computer, and it translates line by line. To compile, on the other hand, means to pile together. A compiler piles together your entire program and translates the whole thing all at once. Which one you use on planet Gobbledygook is entirely up to you. But there is one thing I still don't understand. Does it really matter that the compiler is faster than the interpreter? I mean, everything the computer does is way too fast for me now anyway. 
for some things it can matter a lot. For example, if you have a huge quantity of numbers to work with, or if you want something drawn on the screen very quickly. There's a disc beside pet number one on the other side of the counter. If you load it, you'll see what I mean. Okay. Type deload marble stat. This is a program about statistical probability. The probability of the marble falling into various compartments. It does move rather slowly, doesn't it? That's because the marble stat program is being translated instruction by instruction by the basic interpreter inside the computer. Now look at pet number two. This has the same program on it, but it's already been compiled into machine language. Oh, this moves a lot faster. Actually, it's about 10 times faster. Once it becomes compiled, the whole program is executed in machine language all at once. But where is the compiler? It's on a floppy disk that's already back on the shelf behind you. Oh, pet speed. A way of speeding up the pet. Well, it certainly does that. And similar basic compilers are available to speed up the operations of other microcomputers. I wish we had a way of speeding up our presentation on bits and bytes because we've already run out of time. In our next episode, we will look at various ways of teaching with the computer. Looking at the legend in the upper right-hand corner, Billy, what would you say the blue circles on the map represent? How this way of using the computer has evolved from programmed instruction. They decided to take a textbook and break it up into small, easily digestible items of information arrange these items in a logical sequence, present the first item to the student, and then ask him a multi-choice question. And we'll see what the most advanced forms of computer-assisted instruction look like. Until then, I'm Lou Bagoy. And I'm Billy Van. Bye for now. See you soon.